All right, everyone, if I could have your attention, we're ready to begin our presentations. Before I do that, if you do not have a schedule of the events, these are available at our table. Uh, there is one uh, thing that I need to update you on. The Publications Committee meeting is at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning in the Oriole Grill, not at 8. So everybody up bright and early. So with this, uh, again, is being sent uh, by, via Zoom uh, all over the nation to all of our members who are now watching what's going on. So if you could please uh, turn off your cell phones, turn down your ringers so that there's no interruptions, that would be greatly appreciated. Our first speaker tonight is Mr. Dennis Tucker. Uh, Mr. Tucker is an award-winning national speaker on coins, medals, and antiquities. Uh, he is a life member of the American Numismatic Association and the National or the, the Numismatic Literary Guild. He is also, this is how I interact with him, the pro tem, secretary pro tem of the Rittenhouse Society. He's actually the person who holds us all together uh, in that organization. In 2021, he was named a Kentucky Colonel by the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, it's something which I'm very impressed by because uh, I'm only a captain. So uh, with uh, no further ado, I give you Mr. Tucker, who is going to speak to us on 75 years of Colonials in the Red Book. Thank you so much, Fred. I'm going to assume that everyone can hear me at the moment. <laughs> well, good evening to the Colonial Coin Collectors Club. My name is Dennis Tucker. And I started collecting coins when I was seven years old. Uh, and I've been the publisher at Whitman Publishing since 2004. I've had the privilege of working on 18 editions of the Guidebook of United States Coins, our hobby's beloved Red Book, which this year celebrates its 75th anniversary and 25 million copies sold. I think it's safe to say I have the best job in numismatics. I get to work with legends like Kenneth Brissett, Q. David Bowers, and Jeff Garrett. And I'm pleased to count many of you among my collaborators and coworkers. I feel honored to be with you tonight as we go behind the scenes at Whitman Publishing and look at 75 years of colonial coins and tokens in the Red Book. Before we pull back the curtain, a couple definitions. I'll be using the words colonial and coin broadly from a collector's perspective rather than technical. So we'll be looking at coins, medals, and tokens that were made for the British North American colonies, but also objects that were made after independence in 1776. And of course, some things traditionally collected as colonial coins are neither colonial nor coins, but collectors understand all of this. The second definition, the Red Book's <laughs> author was born Richard Sperry Yo. His friends called him Dick, but to generations of collectors, he was R.S. Yeoman. I'll use that gnome de plume when I refer to him. In this lecture, we'll be seeing three main themes. Number one, colonials have always been in good hands in the Red Book, treated seriously since the first edition was published in 1946. Number two, the people who make the Red Book have a special interest in colonials. We'll see that that started with R.S. Yeoman himself. Number three, the Red Book has grown and changed over the years. It's a living and breathing document just as numismatics is a living and breathing science. In February 1965, R.S. Yeoman compared the appeal of old coins to that of moderns. He said he didn't have an actual distaste for modern commemorative coins, but quote, I simply do not receive enough challenge from this series for my historic appetite. Yeoman told about how he was offered the chance to buy a Bermuda shilling in the mid 1940s. He'd read about them in Crosby's early Coins of America, 
And to gain more perspective, he read Captain John Smith's two volume general history of Virginia. He searched for a Bermuda shilling for a few years and finally found one from a coin dealer in Philadelphia who got it from a stranger who'd picked it up on a beach in the islands. Yeoman wrote, I don't have an uglier coin in my collection. His motivation to collect this coin wasn't money or beauty, it was history. He was excited by the pursuit of knowledge. R.S. Yeoman's personal opinion was that an ugly, worn out Bermuda shilling was far more interesting and significant than a perfectly struck modern half dollar. Ken Brissett brought a scholar's love of colonial coins to Whitman Publishing when he officially joined the Red Book team in 1959. He also brought experience. Starting in 1948, he photographed coins of the Bennington Historical Museum in Vermont while doing research on early Vermont coppers. He was one of the first to develop a portable camera setup for photographing coins. Dave Bowers had been studying and dealing in coins and knew Ken Brissett from the 1950s. Around 1960, he remarked how Ken had used his camera to discover 12 previously unrecorded colonials. The first edition of the Red Book was dated 1947 on the cover, but it was published in November 1946. The first print run of 9,000 copies sold out quickly. Before Yeoman sent the book back to press for its second printing in February 1947, he used the opportunity to order a few editorial corrections. One such edit is famous. It's the one that collectors use to quickly tell whether their first edition is from the first printing or the second printing. It's on page 135, and it's about the silver dollars melted under the Pittman Act of 1918. You can see the uh, Yeoman clarified the text, accounts for the scarcity of this date to accounts for the scarcity of 1903-0. Now you're about to learn something that's never been presented to a live audience. Longtime Red Book collector and historian, Frank Coletti, made a page-by-page -page study of the two printings of the 1947 Red Book. He noted many edits were made in the second printing. Coletti's findings were first published in Ken Brissett's book, A Penny Saved, which debuted earlier this year. Several of these corrections involved colonial and early American coins. On page 29, Connecticut Coppers, in the second printing, the obverses of the 1787 mailed bust facing left and connect variety were properly switched. On page 41, Higley or Granby coppers. In the second printing, the caption for the third set of photographs was clarified with better typography and punctuation. In the first printing, the caption used all caps for everything and the text was run together with no commas. Very confusing. In the second printing, this was edited to make it easier to understand. Punctuation was added, and only the legend, I cut my way through, was set in all caps. And on page 51, Washington medals. In the second printing, the chart for the second Washington medal was corrected from 1783 United States to 1783 unity states. Isn't this correction an easier way to tell if you have a first printing or a second printing? Just flip to page 51 and see if it says United States or unity states. Why should the 1903 New Orleans Morgan dollar get all the attention? Now, these corrections might seem minor, but it's important to note that Yeoman didn't fix every error in the first print run. Printing plate corrections cost a publisher time, effort, and money, especially back then. 
they had to be prioritized. Some typos in the first edition had to wait much longer before they were fixed. For example, in the private and territorial gold, the name of Georgia jeweler Templeton Reed was misspelled three times in the headlines. This wasn't fixed until the third edition. This shows us Yeoman's mindset. Fixing the colonial section was a priority. He saw it as being important to his audience and getting it right was worth the extra expense. Many of the Red Book's early contributors knew a lot about colonial coins and tokens. Ken Brissett and I talked about this recently. He told me, quote, in those early days, coin dealers, at least those who were experienced enough to be asked to be Red Book contributors, were generally real numismatists. Some like Damon Douglas, who was a collector, specialized in only a few areas. But any dealer worthy of the Red Book role knew a lot about the entire range of American numismatics. Here are some other early Red Book contributors identified by Ken Brissett as being very familiar with our nation's earliest money. The first edition of the Red Book had 44 and a half pages covering colonials. That was 17% of the book. In the 75th edition this year, that proportion is smaller. Colonials are only about 12% of the book, but today's Red Book is almost twice as big as the first edition. And we have to apologize to George Morgan and Anthony DeFranciski. In both the first edition and the 75th, the section on Washington medals, it's larger than Morgan dollars and peace dollars combined. Let's look at some of the ways the Red Book has evolved as research and interest in colonial coins has changed over the years. In 1946, the Spanish Eight Reales was given a place of honor in the Red Book as its frontispiece coin. It would hold a special position at the front of the book for 58 years. In the 2006 edition, which brought many changes, the Spanish mill dollar would be folded into the narrative of the introduction to United States coins. More on that in a few minutes. In 1950, the fourth edition of the Red Book was published. And in his preface, R.S. Yeoman explained a new feature. Certain early American coins for which copies and facsimiles are known now have a star next to them along with the fabricator's name. A book review in the Numismatist, April 1951, noted that such facsimiles were, quote, a subject neglected in the literature and that this was a useful addition to the book. In 1960, Russell Rulau coined the term exonumia for coin-like or coin-related objects. The word would be added to Webster's Dictionary in 1965. In the Red Book, there was a major change. Kenneth Brissett, whom Yeoman had hired the year before, was now listed second among the contributors as editorial assistant. In the June 1960 issue of the Whitman Coin Supply Merchandiser, Ken described the process by which the Red Book's prices were updated and how the prices were closely guarded. Even the panel of contributors didn't know the final pricing until the book was published. In the 14th edition, new coin listings were added to the colonial section. The entries for Connecticut, New Jersey, and Washingtonia were completely revised. It's no coincidence that the 14th edition's improvements of an already fine catalog came just after Yeoman hired Ken Brissett, one of the best decisions of Yeoman's career. In the 14th edition, the Red Book's overly enthusiastic printing press operators fixed some errors that weren't really there. They had good intentions, but not enough numismatic knowledge. On page 35, 
1776 continental dollar of the rare misspelled CEY currency type had its misspellings incorrectly corrected. <laughs> In the chart on page 37 for the 1785 Nova Constellatio with pointed rays, the coin spelling of Constellatio was incorrectly corrected to Constellatio. <laughs> Yeoman often talked about this kind of typographical error. He recalled how he would get an urgent call from the press room. He'd have to run down and explain to the, to the pressman that the typos were actually on the coins, not on the page layout. Start the presses up again. In the numismatist, editor Elston Bradfield wrote a nice review of the 14th edition. He noted that many photographs were upgraded and the colonial section was extensively rearranged, and he gave the Red Book a very strong endorsement. In August 1961, Glenn Smedley reviewed the Red Book in the Numismatist. He'd been a contributor to the book since the seventh edition and coordinator of its panel since the eighth, so he brought an insider's insight to his book review. Related to our subject, Smedley noted that a controversial entry, the 1742 dated gold doubloon was removed in the 15th edition. In 1962, Eric Newman and Ken Brissett published their book, The Fantastic 1804 Dollar. This was also the year that numismatic researcher, Neil Schaefer, seen here with R.S. Yeoman, joined the Whitman publishing staff and Brissette was promoted to the position of coordinating editor. In the Numismatist, June 1963, Whitman Publishing disclosed the results of its annual reader survey. 3,500 questionnaires were sent out and about 1,000 replies were received. Of those, nearly 60% of respondents had membership in some numismatic organization. Today, I estimate that maybe 10% of the Red Book's readers belong to a hobby group. Even more so now than then, the Red Book has grown into a mainstream publication with mass market distribution. Hundreds of thousands of copies are sold every year, making the Red Book the single biggest public relations agent for colonial coins and tokens. The big coin news of 1964, of course, was the release of the new John F. Kennedy half dollar, issued to celebrate the recently martyred president. The Red Book that year, the 18th edition, broke all sales records with 1.2 million copies sold. A major addition in the colonial section shows how the Red Book changes with new research. This was the edition of the rare 1786 Immunis Columbia, New Jersey cent. The coin had long been known to exist, but it was generally unlisted in catalogs because of its rarity and because some questioned its authenticity. Ken Brissett noted at the time, quote, with the appearance of a new specimen, leading authorities are now able to determine that the variety is legitimate. Today, three examples of the so-called scrawny eagle coins are known. In the 19th edition, published in 1965, the Bermuda shilling was expanded to list for the first time both small sale and large sale varieties. R.S. Yeoman retired from Whitman management in 1970. On the occasion of the Red Book's silver anniversary in 1971, Ken Brissett was determined to make changes big enough to advertise a completely revised edition. Nearly every page was modified in one way or another. The colonial section was completely revamped. Some coins were deleted because they were determined to be inauthentic. The 1776 New Hampshire copper with WM in the center. The New England Stiver. 
the so-called Good Samaritan shilling, which Ken Brissett has noted was, quote, long known to be spurious, but included as a supplementary note. New entries in the 25th edition included the Mason's Mill coinage, the Albany Church Penny, and the Theater at New York token. All of these have been part of the Red Book ever since. In a sister section of the book, the large sense got a complete facelift. The early American Coppers Club reorganized the section and chose varieties to be included or deleted. 1971 was also the year the 10 millionth Red Book came off the printing press. This milestone copy was of the book was presented to R.S. Yeoman by Gerald Slade, the president of Western Publishing. In 1972, in the 26th edition, another eagle-eyed printing press operator almost caused a delay in the Red Book's release. Soon after production started, he noticed a misspelled word and immediately called for a stop press. He wanted to correct <laughs> page 23, where the 1788 Vermont cent was listed with a backward C in Octori. <laughs> Fortunately, a Whitman editor, probably Neil Schaefer or Ken Brissett, was checking the printing operation and explained to the pressman that the backward C was intentional. The presses were fired back up without delay. And today we describe the backward C with descriptive text rather than typography. In the 27th edition, published in 1973, the passing of the torch from R.S. Yeoman to Ken Brissett was official. Ken was now listed as the book's editor. The 27th edition demonstrates that dramatic changes in the Red Book come not only from numismatic research, but also from the marketplace. Recent sales of colonial coins, including some from the Massachusetts Historical Society, gave the editors fresh new market data. Some of the scarcer colonial pieces in the 27th edition saw significant price increases. In 1979, the first coin to break the half million dollar mark was the Brasher, I'm sorry, the Brazier doubloon with EB on the wing. It auctioned for $725,000. Notice in the text, we used to tell our readers how to pronounce Brazier instead of Brasher. In 1983, Dave Bowers started his term as president of the American Numismatic Association. And Ken Brissett was appointed director of ANAX. Bowers wrote a wonderful nostalgia piece for the numismatist called The Guidebook Revisited. He praised the book's introduction. Quote, every year or so I reread it just to refresh my memory concerning the development of the country's monetary system. Good advice. Still, no book is flawless. In the 37th edition on page 51, the obverse of the 1783 Georgia's Triumphal token was printed reversed. So the portrait faces left and the inscription runs backward. If you find a coin like this, Tony <laughs> Terranova will pay it, will buy it for a million dollars. In 1986, the U.S. Mint's American Eagle Bullion program started. In its 40th edition, the Red Book's page count was increased for the first time. It grew from 256 to 272 pages. The colonial section stayed at 45 pages. On the colonial front in 1987, coins salvaged from the Spanish Galleon Atosha went to auction. In 1987, Whitman minted a limited edition silver medal with its design based on the Spanish pillar dollar. The cover of the 41st edition Red Book featured a drawing based on the coin. 
These silver medals were offered to Red Book readers for $10.95. 1,000 were minted. A similar offer was made for buyers of the Blue Book. Its silver medal recreated the reverse motif of the Spanish dollar. In 1988, Walter Breen's Complete Encyclopedia of U.S. and Colonial Coins was published. The cover of the 42nd edition Red Book featured an illustration based on the continental dollar. This was the design of the Red Book Silver Round issued this year. And here's the Blue Book Silver Round. RS led an active life as a hobby ambassador well into his 80s. On November 9, 1988, he suffered a fatal stroke while driving his car near his retirement community in Arizona. The numismatic community mourned his passing. The Red Book was expanded again in 1990 from 272 pages to 288. The colonial section was redesigned and supplemented with much new information. In 1993, Ken Brissett began his term as president of the ANA. The Red Book ad in the August numismatist that year featured a bigger than life continental dollar. For the 50th edition published in 1996, many photographs were upgraded to color. Ken, Briss Ken Brissett described it as a feasibility experiment one so successful that the, the decision was made to expand to full color throughout the book in the future. Within the colonials, the Massachusetts silver coins were greatly expanded and varieties were added for other state coins. In 1999, for the 53rd edition, Ken Brissett's name was added to the cover, acknowledging his position at the helm of the Red Book. The early 2000s saw a dramatic expansion in the U.S. Mint's state quarters and new commemorative coins. Color photography continued to upgrade the Red Book. If you look at the 52nd edition, published in 1998, colonials are about 50 pages, and about half of the photos are in color. By the 58th edition, published in 2004, all but a handful of very rare colonials are shown in full color. Four new sections debuted with the 58th edition in 2004. Coins from Treasures and Hordes by Dave Bowers was a nine page essay that thrilled readers with stories of the Castine hoard of colonial era, era coins, including Massachusetts pine tree shillings, the Bank of New York hoard of several thousand 1787 Fujio cents and other exciting treasures. In Great Collectors and Collections of the Past, Ron Guth and Jeff Garrett told about collectors like Colonel James Ellsworth, John Work Garrett, Waldo Newcomer, Mrs. R. Henry Norweb, James Ross Snowden, and others who owned rare colonial coins and built amazing collections. A numismatic glossary was introduced this year. This dictionary included terms relevant to colonials like billing, doubloon, electrotype, and restrike. And this was the first year of the top 250 coin prices realized, compiled by Scott Rubin. This list included continental dollars, willow trees, and various other high value colonials. 2005 was my first full year at Whitman Publishing. The first major project I undertook was to map a redesign of the entire Red Book's information architecture, the order in which the book's sections are organized, and its visual design, including the use of colored page headers for navigation and hierarchical typography of the category heads and subheads. 
with input from Ken Brissett, Dave Bowers, and editorial director, Diana Plattner, I wrote up a 12 page plan. Our goal was to improve the reader's experience, make the book easier to use, and make it more visually attractive. We also increased the page count to exceed 400 pages for the first time, up to 416. We moved the Spanish, the Spanish milled dollar from the frontispiece to the welcome to numismatic section. Before the 59th edition, all of the front of the book material was grouped into 10 separate and hierarchically equal categories from the British colonies in America to first United States mint issues. Everything was in a big bucket. Coins authorized by British Royal Patent were there. So were 1792 federal issues authorized by Congress. In the 59th edition, we rearranged all of this front of the book material to bring more clarity and definition. We put most of the coins and tokens into a single overarching section we called pre-federal issues. We divided pre-federal into colonial issues and post-colonial issues. And we moved continental dollars, Nova Constellatio patterns, Fugio cents, and 1792 coinage under their own heading of contract issues and patterns as the first section of what we called federal issues. Continental dollars would be moved out of federal issues a few years down the road, as we'll see in a moment. This was all to organize the thousand moving parts of the quote unquote colonial section into a new format that's easy for a layman to digest and understand while also being internally logical and technically accurate. The 2006 edition of the Red Book was truly a revolution. If you're looking for a fun mental exercise, some cold winter evening, open a 2005 edition and a 2006 edition side by side, and you'll see this restructuring emerge in front of you. As the years have gone by, we've continued to upgrade the colonial images. Tom Mulvaney was on staff for several years as our professional photographer. We take advantage of modern digital photography and techniques. And we have access to the archives of contributors like Stax Powers Galleries, Heritage Auctions, and the Smithsonian Institution. We've continued to increase the number of grades we price, expanding into the lower end of circulated coins and tokens, and also into the higher circulated and uncirculated grades. In this way, we price colonials for every collector, the newcomer who starts out with worn but easily affordable coins, and the specialist who strives for higher end finer pieces. We've had many, many editorial conversations over the years. Should a grade be priced if a coin isn't yet known to exist in that grade? How do we price a rare colonial coin if it hasn't been auctioned in 20 or 30 years? What about unique pieces? We update our narrative text when new research warrants it. Often when I talk to students about the importance of good research and writing, I present a case study of Max Spiegel solving a 200 year old colonial coin mystery. Generations of collectors knew about the Standish Berry threepence, but didn't know who its mysterious figure was. From 1946 to 2009, the Red Book said that the portrait was probably George Washington. In 2009, Max Spiegel dug into the archives of the Baltimore Sun and found evidence that pointed to James Calhoun, the first mayor of Baltimore. Spiegel compared contemporary portraits of Calhoun to the figure on the silver token. Since the 64th edition published in 2010, 
we've demoted George Washington and say that the portrait is probably that of James Calhoun. In 2007, for the 61st edition, we added a new feature on the Libertas Americana Medal and expanded the grade listings in various pre-federal sections. In 2008, for the 62nd edition, we continued to expand our pricing. By this time, we were including significant auction records within the price charts to give our readers deeper understanding of the market for colonials. Over the years, Ray Williams, Roger Saboni, Christopher McDowell, and others have been very helpful in expanding, reorganizing, and fleshing out various states and coin types. In recent years, we've used the precious real estate of the Red Book's front cover to publicize colonial coins. In 2017, for the 71st edition, we put a 1787 Fujio copper with club rays on the front cover. On the 72nd edition, we featured a 1792 birch scent. And on the 74th, we had the eagle reverse of a 1787 Munis Columbia copper. And if you worry about the future of colonials in the Red Book, now that Ken Brissett has been kicked upstairs to editor emeritus, fear not. Jeff Garrett is now the Red Book's senior editor. Read his foreword to Ken's new book, A Penny Saved, and you'll see how deeply he cares about early American coins and tokens. In fact, Jeff says, the information on early American money is among the most valuable parts of the Red Book. And as far as Whitman Publishing is concerned, the future of colonial and early American coins and tokens is very bright. As always, we welcome and invite comments, ideas, feedback, and assistance from the Colonial Coin Collectors Club. Your enthusiasm is what guarantees continued progress. I have two case studies I'm going to discuss. I, I, I put this interstitial uh, slide in here thinking that I might encounter some technical problems and, have, and be a bit delayed, but things are going smoothly. So I, I have two case studies um, that illustrate the kinds of changes that colonials have experienced in the Red Book. Our first case study involves European coins that were used as money in the colonies. In 2012, in the 66th edition, we added a full page of introductory text to the pre-1792 section titled, Collecting Pre-Federal Issues. This followed the welcome to numismatics and it introduced readers to the appeal of collecting early Americana. In 2016, for the 70th edition, we recast this narrative as the first page of a brand new section called Foreign Coins in the Colonies. This was the brainchild of Ken Brissett. Page space is always at a premium in the Red Book. And every year we have more and more modern quarters, dollar coins, commemoratives, and bullion to fit in. Ken argued persuasively for carving out space for much older coins, the British, Spanish, Dutch, French, and other European money that Americans used during the colonial era. We budgeted a total of four pages for historical text, photographs, and type charts. This relatively new section will continue to evolve. In fact, we're looking at adding foreign gold coins to its coverage. To compare this section to a popular modern series, it's about the same amount of space that we'll devote to American silver eagles next year. Our second case study illustrates the Red Book's changing coverage of continental dollars. 
This will be a very high level discussion of a complex subject. For more detail, I invite you to see Appendix D of Dave Bauer's Guidebook of Continental Currency and Coins. The first Red Book included slightly less than a page of text and illustrations covering the continental currency pieces. They were grouped under the category of tokens and pattern coins, along with the 1776 Massachusetts coppers, Nova Constellatio issues, Immune Columbia, and Confederatio cents, and Grazier doubloons. Six types were cataloged. In 1946, numismatic understanding justified a definitive statement about the continental dollar's monetary role. Quote, it was the first silver dollar struck for the United States. But some speculation was necessary, including that it was possibly struck in Birmingham, England. By the 13th edition, published in 1959, pricing was expanded to include uncirculated pieces. The 14th edition published 1960 was the first to put forth Elijah Gallaudet as the possible engraver of the dies. The text continued to change with ongoing research. The 18th edition published in 1964 reported that quote, the coins were probably struck in Philadelphia by this time, seven varieties were cataloged. Probably everybody in the room right now has a different opinion on where these pieces came from. As the market for continental dollars matured, more grades were priced. Extremely fine was added in the 20th edition, published 1966. The 30th edition, published in 1976, moved the continental dollar from tokens and pattern coins to speculative issues, tokens, and patterns. This group no longer included the 1776 Massachusetts coppers and Grazier doubloons, which had been moved to coinage of the states. The 40th edition published in 1986 shared the latest numismatic understanding that, quote, the coins were probably struck in Philadelphia. Information on replica pieces was updated to discuss the 1876 Centennial Expo restrikes and the copies of 1961. In the early 1990s, the text became more precise and accurate. They were no longer referred to as continental dollars, but as continental currency. Their fundamental mystery was emphasized, quote, the exact nature of their monetary role is still unclear. More research revealed that, quote, there may have been two separate emissions made at different mints. A controversial theory was mentioned that the brass variety may have been a substitute for a penny. By the 50th edition, published in 1997, six grades were priced from good to uncirculated. The 56th edition published 2002 identified the engraver as quote, undoubtedly Elijah Gallaudet. In the dramatically revised 59th edition, which we've discussed, the continental currency pieces were categorized as federal issues rather than colonial or pre-federal. This made them more akin to the Philadelphia Mint's 1792 pattern coinages. Pewter pieces were said to have probably served as substitutes for a dollar of paper currency, and brass and silver pieces were conjecture, conjectured to be experimental or patterns. Eight different varieties were cataloged, along with quantities known, and the market was robust enough for valuations editor Jeff Garrett to price every variety. Research has continued in recent years, as you know, and is summarized in Bauer's Guidebook of Continental Currency and Coins. Most recently in the 75th edition of the Red Book, 
the continental currency pieces have been moved from the federal issues section where they were classified as the first of the contract issues and patterns before the Nova Constellatio patterns of 1783. We now put them as the first of the post-colonial issues before the Nova Constellatio coppers of the 1780s. So we moved them from federal to post-colonial. We've also dramatically softened all definitive authoritative language around these pieces. Given the uncertain nature, we're light on language like these are, these were used as, these were minted in, and heavy on language like possibly, undocumented, theories, and studies suggest. If concrete evidence comes to light, we stand ready to move them around as needed and to update their narrative. In the meantime, the physical nature of the continental currency pieces is as well documented as we can get it. And their retail and auction markets are captured in finely grained red book detail. I hope that you will keep in touch with me if you have questions or feedback or ideas on how to change or make the colonial section better in the Red Book. My email is here, dennis.tucker at whitman.com. And I'm also happy to answer any questions that you might have now. And I thank you for your time. Anybody has any questions, I'll relay them to make sure you can hear them. Does anybody have any questions? Well, I have a question for the group. Uh, how many people have more than eight red books at their house. <laughs> How many people have more than 15 red books at their house? 20? Golly. All right. You can't see the number of hands that are up, but uh, when we started off, it was, it was a good 80% of the room. So uh, it, that goes to show how influential uh, this book is uh, to numismatics and to colonial coinage. Jim? If you were a question or perhaps you made it a group, I'm just wondering how many of us had their first uh, exposure to colonial through coming through the Red Book? Probably most of yeah. us. So now we're asking, did you hear that question, Dennis? We ask uh, how many people had their first experience with coins through the Red Book and uh, colonial coins through the Red Book? And uh, we had uh, probably about half of the room raise their hand. So uh, that's it's a great uh, influencer. I want to present you, since you're, this is Zoom, I can't, I'll fax you a copy of this. <laughs> we have, I have here a, uh, a plaque, which I will mail to you uh, from wonderful. the Colonial Coin Collectors Club. It says uh, to Dennis Tucker for his presentation entitled 75 Years of Colonials in the Red Book. And was, this is as part of the Eric P. Newman Memorial Lectureship Series. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you.